Hello, guys. Welcome to Loving Life Conversation Series. People who change the world. Today we have Sage, my favorite yoga teacher in the entire universe. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I try to be a good person. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in your class today, you know, I wrote about you, and I say every time I go to your class, I cry, and it's. The only yoga class I do that, and today, in the middle of our yoga class, I cried because I felt happiness. It was so powerful to me because I just felt it.、Mm. Do you know your effect on people like that?、Um, not in the moment, because、um, in the moment I'm just. In myself, it's it's when I hear people resp- say things back to me, like just now when you said you felt happiness. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. To me, that just tells me like I'm doing all the things necessary to be done that I'm supposed to bring as、uh, in the moment the spiritual leader that's leading everybody in the class. Interesting. I have to think about that. I have to go. And process that that's coming off of me. Yes. Because I don't know if I'm if I'm reflecting myself. Not that I'm not happy. It's just I'm in a I'm looking at something else, and so it's interesting that that process is producing that sensation. Because I hear a lot. Sometimes students will say,、um, "I just feel love coming off of you," and I'm like, "That's." Interesting, because that's not what I'm intending. I'm intending to hold the space, but what I'm hearing is that holding that you're doing is producing the sensation of love, of acceptance, and I think that's what I want. I want people to feel those things. So that's good. It's good. It's interesting. Happiness. I have to think about that. Yes, yes. I think you nailed it. Is loving coming through people? Because when I felt happiness. It was because I felt so happy to be with you, to have you in my life, to have your presence, and that was happiness. You said something. What you care about is holding the space and doing all the things. What What is holding the space? What are the things that you are doing? <sighs> <laughs> okay, we're getting right into it.、Um, holding the space. It's a very large concept.、Um, how I came to this technique is, I started thinking about what is required for a human to be a human. And when I was taking yoga classes, I found that, and this is not a judgment against yoga teachers. I found that sometimes yoga teachers were trying to force me to be something, and I just thought that was uncomfortable.、Um, not bad, just uncomfortable. And so when I went to teach, I try as much as I can not to be in the place of dictating or pushing. More in the in the space of I'm walking on this dark path with the lantern. And you can come with me if you want, you know. And whatever that person is bringing, I let all of that come into the path. And what I find is, the more that I let it come in, the more people feel accepted. It's like sometimes in class, it'll be the day that everybody's late, right? And I find that instead of me. Wanting the students to be there on time is like okay. This person accepting that this person has their own things going on with them, and that they are trying as much as they can to be in the space. So I just have to let that be. And what I find is it's kind of like a bubble. It's like we have a bubble when the class starts. The person comes in late, and then I just let them come into the bubble. There's a little bit of adjustment that happens, and instead of Fighting that, I let the adjustment happen, and then it all settles into a new bubble, and then we can go 
onto the journey well, where we are, wherever the journey is for that particular class, that particular day. I was so moved when you say when people are late, you think about they're trying as much as they can because I was always in that situation and, and Omar knows this. I was literally like rushing through everything to be there on time and then a lot of time if I know I'm late and then it's a lot of mental exercise here to say oh maybe I just don't go because I don't want to be that person who is embarrassed and, and yeah so thank you for saying that with, with that said I also think getting there early you get more all of it I'm curious what is how did your journey with yoga started in the first place can you share the story oh my goodness um, I mean wow well how it I I had been doing yoga before this point. I just wasn't taking it serious. It was just something that I was just doing because I thought it was fun. Um, I used to dance a long time ago <laughs> in my 20s. And so, you know, movement for me is very natural. And so at the time I was like, doing karate and I had gotten a black belt and it got to the point in my karate practice where I felt like nothing was happening. And me and my a friend of mine David we were we were both in karate and and not that David was experiencing the same thing that I was experiencing but we were there at that point in the journey and David was like let's take a yoga class I'm like yeah let's do that and that day I went to the class it was like the thing that I was missing it showed up and so I started doing the work um, my teacher that I reference all the time she's also a really good friend of mine um, she started a yoga teaching training company and she was like, you want to train? And I'm like, oh yeah. I mean, literally, I'm just doing this because I felt like I wanted, it was the thing that I needed. It helped my karate practice started to move again. I started to feel this thing. And I remember we were in class and she was explaining to me what yoga does to you. You know, your body is going to change, your spirit is going to change, your emotions are going to change, your mind is going to change. And I was like looking at her because she's very, I love Ambria, <laughs> but she's very love and light. And so I was like, okay, girl, great. <laughs> Amazing. Wonderful. Yeah. You know, yeah, this is it. And, you know, after I graduated, I started teaching yoga and I felt it. The I started teaching yoga and then maybe like six months into teaching yoga, this, I'm going to call it a sadness, started to rise to the surface and I got so confused. You know, at that time, I was living my life. I was young. Everything was great. You know, I'm a yoga teacher. I'm a karate teacher. I'm doing things that I want to do. But this sadness started to rise up and I was talking to my, fr my teacher about it and she was just like, sit with it. And that, that's what yoga is about. Sit with it. And as I started to sit with it, I'm, yoga broke me open. I found that I realized that I wasn't being the person that I felt inside. There was a, dis a disconnect between who I was looking at in the mirror and who I was feeling inside. And that disconnect, the sadness was feeding into that disconnect. And in Instead of running away from my practice, I just, because at the time that was my only tool, I didn't have the resources to go to a therapist, you know, I actually couldn't even articulate, if I went to a therapist, I don't think I could have articulated what, that, what was going on, so I started diving into my practice, and what started happening was my body started, like I had this, these injuries started showing up, these restrictions started showing up, and I started finding that I had to adjust my practice, use props, switch things up, basically care for myself. And then as I started caring for myself, I recognized that what was beneath all of that was this trans person seeking to become a spiritual leader. And that the yoga because I, I text my teacher all the time, if it wasn't for yoga, 
I, we wouldn't be having this interview because there was a point where I literally thought what was going on inside of me was going to take me away from life. I didn't know if I was going to wake up in the morning. I would go to sleep at night with anxiety because I wasn't sure that I was going to make it. And if it wasn't for yoga really helping me to unite with my body and connect with who I really truly am, I, I wouldn't be here to this moment. And so when people come to class, I try to illuminate the transformational power of yoga that you coming to a plateau is natural. That's a part of the practice. And it, I think that most people are looking for the practice to come in and like swoop them up. And it was me deciding to dive into the practice, deciding to, okay, this half moon pose, you know, usually I can put my hand on the ground. I can't even, I can barely balance. And so I had to reshape what it means to take care of myself, what it means to be in a practice, what it means to be embodied so that I could, I mean, at that point, I was just like, I just want to live. I, I, I don't want to have this pressure of not being able to live. I want, I want to live. And now the work is I'm changing that to thriving. I want to, I want to thrive. And I know that because I've seen it, like, my yoga practice, like right now my plantar on my right side is showing up. And mm. that to me is saying deeper because you can't just take care of a plant. It's not something that you can just take care of. It takes time to heal. It takes patience. I have to transform how I get out of the bed. I have to transform when I want to be somewhere on time. I have to warm up my plantar. I got to get, if I have to run, I can't just run. I can't just go to karate. I have to like come to class 30 minutes earlier, prepare my body for the practice. When the practice is over, prepare my body to leave. Like I, there, all this work had to come in for me to be. And what that was reflecting back is like the deep levels of care that, I, that yoga is trying to inspire in me through a physical practice. And um, right now, I'm, I'm I think I'm still steadily climbing. It's slowed down a little bit because of some, maybe because of the, the plantar is like. Plantar. Like, it's the bottom. There's a, a fascia that goes up the whole back part of your body. But yeah. it's the bottom of my foot and it's inflamed. Oh. And that's what it, that's kind of what it means. Is it's like that process. So when I, like, for example, we're sitting long, I can feel it start to inflame and I don't look at it as a negative I look at it as you know my body is saying you're neglecting me oh so we stretch our legs that's fine <laughs> sure? yeah. I'm not saying that it's debil debilitating me I just have worked so hard to have such a deeper connection to my body and so when my body is saying something I try to recognize it immediately and so right now my body is saying because you know the plantar is really close to the bone. So this is something that's so internal that is required to help me walk through life is saying, I need attention. You need to look at me. You know, b being trans, and I equate that because I experience gender dysphoria where sometimes there's a disconnect between what my body is looking like and what I'm feeling on the inside. And when I have these things, it's still ref reminding me that there's still a disconnect that I'm working through. There's still this thing that I have to reconcile so that I can start to move forward to the next part of my practice. Speaking of that, I'm having numbness in my feet. <laughs> oh my God. This is a hard, this is a hard position. It's a very hard position. To be sitting yes, in. Yes, it is. That's the, one of the, that's why, I mean, I'm making something very simple. It's much more complicated than what I'm going to say, but one of the reasons why yoga was developed was those masters were trying to sit in comfortableness to to reflect on the self. And when they sat in this 
cross-legged position or in lotus, it was uncomfortable. Mm. And so they just designed stretches and movements to move the body around so that when they come back to sit, it's more comfortable. Which is why at the end of class when we sit up and I say take a comfortable seated position, it feels comfortable because we did all that work to create the space. The whole class is really about those last three minutes. I mean, in traditional yoga, there's a whole other class that happens <laughs> after they sit up. <laughs> you know, in our modern Western world, that's the end, but that's actually just the beginning. So the, these, the, the, the comfortable seated position is designed to be uncomfortable? Yes. Why? Well, because how else are we as humans going to figure it out? Like, we're not like, we're not like this tree. The, the wind blows this tree, and eventually the tree, instead of fighting against the wind, is going to go with the wind. And then start to create itself from that change. Humans are not like that. The wind blows, and we're like, I'm not going to move. The water is coming up. It's like, oh, I can swim. You know, we're, we're fighting against it, and so we have to to use tools to help us learn how to come back to the self. And like I said earlier, when that sadness rose, rose up, the, my first thing was to do was to resist it, right? Because at the time I was a yoga teacher and people were saying, you know, you're so amazing. This thing is happening. I'm confused because I'm like, I'm so sad. I'm beyond sad. I don't know where this amazingness is coming from. But okay, I'll just go with it. But that's, I was resisting it. And in the moment that I stopped resisting and started to really dive into what was really making me upset is the moment I started living. What was that? Um, I was... And, and the story that I'm going to tell is like this story is just the, the fifth in time that this has happened to me. I feel like my life has been saying I'm trans my whole life. I just was resisting it. But I got to a place in my practice and I went to visit a friend who was in social work school and she was describing the feelings that this trans person was telling her in her class. And it was the first time that I heard from the outside of me how I felt on the inside. And I immediately started crying. Like that was the thing that came out. It was like this tears. And I looked at her and I'm like, I think that's my issue. It's like, I'm trans. And I just did not realize that until this moment. And that was the moment that I felt I started living. Because then the things that I was feeling, I literally started dealing with. Like, it started coming to the surface. These, I mean, at the time I was 37, I'm 45 now. So this, to me, is very recent. But, you know, what started happening was I would be walking down the street and I would have a memory. And then I would have the real memory. I would remember the memory that I augmented. And then the real memory would come back. All of the feelings that I was feeling in the moment, clarity came up. It's like, oh, that's why I ran away from South Carolina. I was like, I was trying to find myself. I started dancing because when I danced, I felt like I could just be myself. I went into acting because that acting was requiring the self-knowledge. I, d I didn't understand that. And so then all these choices and interactions and experience started coming back to me and then the reality started coming back to me. And yoga was one of the two. Yoga and karate. I'm not, not going to just push karate to the side because karate gave me the strength, the power to push through. Yoga was the healing part and karate was the empowering part. And if it wasn't for those two ingredients, again, like I said, I wouldn't be here. I could, I could be homeless. I could be a drug addict. There were, so many things were trying to take me down. And if it wasn't for these two gifts that were given to me, I wouldn't have surmounted enough to be able to come to class and give real knowledge to be a, a beacon of real, like, general guidance along the journey. 
because there's so much in you and you're so powerful and it's because of the gift of karate and yoga they guide you yes on the path yes. of becoming a spiritual yes. leader yes 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 which is what i've always wanted if you had asked me as a child what do you want i would have been like i need to be some kind of priest priestess some person that people come to for guidance and help them to understand this this is all that was in my head as a child all i wanted i just i just feel like if i grew up in a world where i would have identified my queerness sooner i would have started that journey sooner it 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 took coming leaving all of the spaces and coming to here to meet people so that then that journey could start. Can you talk about an example or some example how did you discover the queerness? What does what does that feel like? Okay, questions. <laughs> um I think that's a I think I'm still discovering that. I think that when I first quote unquote transitioned I my initial reaction was that it needs to be woman and as I have broken down and uncovered it's not that it needs to be woman I feel that when someone in body is as queer there are particular frequencies of masculine feminine androgynous mm-hmm. and neither or both that that person is seeking to express and sometimes because of the world that we live in there are no words for that and what i learned from my journey is that's why you're here the purpose of that is for you to find the words for that to carve out those spaces so that you can expand and grow and thrive but so that future generations who are now coming up behind can do the same so there i don't know if it can be i don't know if it can be defined i think it's defined individually if i five define it for myself where i am right now i would say my queerness is there are moments where i'm very femme very 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 extremely femme and there are moments where i don't have anything that i would call a gender and so, and that is not something that i can predict so and so that was part of the issue so i would go to sleep feeling very femme and then i would wake up and then there's confusion that i have to go through because i'm not feeling that anymore uh, that's the sense of i is changing and I've learned that my sense of I is on a spectrum and that the moment I allow myself to be the spectrum the moment I can start to not suffer as much. And so I think that when people say I I feel so accepted in your in your class what I try to reflect back to them is like oh that's because I accept myself. When I walk into class, whoever is showing up, I'm putting effort into accepting that person. And so when someone walks into class, I'm I'm accepting even if it's irritating because I'm used to that. I'm used to being slightly irritated with how I'm feeling because what's going on with me. And since I started to be allow myself to just be okay with that, then when someone is quote unquote irritating, it's not distracting me. It's just this vibration that's there and like I accept it and if there is something that I have to like process after then after a class I process it because it's not their problem that's my problem that thing that's rising up in me has nothing to do with them it's me it happens a lot when you have kids because a lot of time My son who's 2 year old if he does something I get angry it's not because what he does it's because what he does triggers all the memory yes. of me and that's and what then, I was talking about earlier parents adults see themselves in the child and I don't think the children all always see themselves in the adult I think they it, there's a mis- a disconnect they're still trying to understand 
what's going on. And I don't, I don't think that in our society that, that a child really sees that until they're an adult. And I'm trying to eliminate that. Because if I saw my parents as individuals, as a child, it would have changed my entire interaction with them. Like where we are right now in our relationship is hard because I'm going through such a major change, but we have historic behaviors that I have to now move through. And there's, a ref- there's something that they're going through that I'm not going through because I'm not a parent. And so I'm trying to work out that thing <laughs> with the kids so that when I get to the place where I can transform that relationship that I have with my parents, because it's not their fault. And, and that's the hard part. I don't know right now if I talk to my parents if I'm going to be able to speak in a way that it's not their fault. It's not their fault. I'm not mad at them. The situation makes me mad. My parents did everything they were supposed to do. They, they, everything that was at their disposal, they did everything that they could do. And so it's not their fault. But at the same time, what they were doing affected me. And as an adult working with kids, I can see that. So I don't have, I'm not mad at them. I don't want to be mad anymore. I want to be past the anger so that when we are moving through the changes that they're going to have to go through, I can navigate it. Because right now, I'm just going to get mad. And then what are we doing? Like, I don't see a point in that. That's not communication. I want to communicate. Does that make sense? And so the same thing that's going through you and your child, I'd be going through with my parents, which sounds to me as an imbalance. It doesn't, I don't, I don't want that relationship. I want to cultivate a relationship where I feel that I come from you, that I feel connected to you beyond what the world says I'm obligated to feel. So there's a real acceptance in your practice. It's accepting yourself, accepting others, and by creating a connection and seeing what other person is going through, you are able to cultivate that culture of acceptance. It's not easy, but yes. <laughs> because there are some times where, where I have issues that is harder. Like when someone is not... I don't want to call people small-minded. That's not the word I want to say. When someone is not educated on where we are moving into the new. And so in the new, like when I grew up, you just fit in. Ha. You just do what everybody else does. Even though my generation is a Gen Xer, you know, we were very individual. You know, we, I had blonde hair. I walked around the city with my little <laughs> smiley face leather book bag, you know. <laughs> In South Carolina, that was very like, (laughs) what are you doing? Wow. But like, even though we were very individual, we were still trained to fit in. Where we are in the new is, I'm going to express to you who I really am. I'm going to let that thing show up and that there's a conflict. Because in the old, those things, if you're not a part of the group, (laughs) then that thing should not exist. And in the new is, I now am trying to create this group to manifest a space so that it can all show up. And that can be difficult when certain people are still holding on to, you have to fit in. This is really the key of the paradigm shift I see. Because it used to be, oh, you have to fit in. You have to climb the corporation ladder to rise from analyst to manager to director, managing director. But now more people are really pursuing their passion, whatever that is. And I believe, I think Steve Jobs said it beautifully, people who have passion can change the world for the better. Yes. And this is what I really believe in and I think what you really believe in and then by creating a culture like this we can empower more people to pursue their passion yes i mean i think that it's like the other week i said to the class everybody is needed um that's the that's kind of part of what happened for me what i recognized is that i grew up in a world that i didn't feel like a part of 
So when I went to school and they were talking about organisms, and that organisms had all these parts that worked together, I didn't connect that. So when I took that test, it didn't make sense to me because I didn't feel connected. When they were talking about the universe, that this whole thing, I didn't connect to that. It wasn't until I started to accept myself to realize like, oh, oh, I'm here. And then I started studying about queerness in the past and, and previous incarnations. Like, oh, this thing was a part of the universe. I'm a part of the, I'm a part of the universe. <laughs> We're all connected. Like that, once that went off, then I understood, like, oh, we're all, like, the earth is an organism that has many bodies human, birds, fish, water, trees, grass, rocks. Like, it's all a part of it. Because if we didn't have water, then the system wouldn't work. If we didn't have animals, the system wouldn't work. If we didn't have plants, the system wouldn't work. We're going out into the universe to find planets that support life. Life is not a singular. It's a, a system. And so that's when it woke up to me. It's like, oh, the problem is people don't know they belong. We don't even realize how we're alienating people, how we're creating distance between us. Even though I can say I love you, but that love you is not bringing me closer. Yes. Love is a magnetic force. It's supposed to... The, we are rotating around the sun because the planet loves the sun. The sun is rotating in our galaxy because the sun loves the other parts of the galaxy. The galaxy is rotating in the cosmos because the galaxy loves all the other parts of the cosmos. It's like, love is magnetic and it draws us in and I was finding that when people were saying love, I felt I was being pushed away. And so... The more I try to recognize in my own self that I'm a part of this, I feel like I'm, I'm healing. I'm healing. And then I'm like, well, if I don't feel, if I don't feel this way, then other people are feeling the same. And so I need, when I teach class and we get to the end and we've been breathing together and we've been moving together and we just laid down and like gave it all up together, <laughs> sitting up, I think the more powerful point is like, you are needed. Like, the thing that woke up from that shavasana is needed. Without you, the world does not run. How many philosophers, inventors, future business people, work, speakers never got to speak? Never got told that what you're doing is what we needed. How much have we lost we say that we're advanced, but if people are not being themselves, then we are losing out on the, the nutrients that they bring to our world. And so that's why, that's why I'm like, I need to thrive, because just surviving is not enough. Um, queer ancestors from before, that's what they, all they did. They were just trying to survive. That was their life. Um, the moment that really changed me is that I saw a statistic, and I'm a trans woman. The life expectancy of a trans woman is 35. And when I read that, at the time I was 40, I was like, <laughs> every day is a blessing because I wasn't supposed to be here. I wasn't supposed to make it through my transition. I was supposed to just vanish. And now as I wake up every day, it's like, this is a blessing. And I need to make sure that I'm a part of everything. That I'm there. That when I'm asked to show up, I show up. And whatever I need to do to make that happen, I'm going to do. Because that's... And so then what started happening is people started showing up. People started being themselves. People have started feeling love or feeling this thing because I just, I showed up. And then I talked to my teacher about it and she was like, oh, that's yoga. And I'm like, oh, thanks. Meanwhile, I would flash back to that story that she was telling me. I'm like, she was, tell she was preparing me for this moment. She was preparing me that you're on this journey. You can't see it right now, but this thing is 
going to manifest. You're going to become something. This yoga journey is starting somewhere. Not that I'm at the end. It's just, it's, it's moving. It's definitely moving. You already are. You know, I, I recently wrote an article called Starting Life Anew in Silicon Valley. Mm. But I realized it was actually your class. Mm. When I first joined your class, I was, it was just after I gave birth to my daughter. Mm. And then, you know, I shared I had depression. And my first experience with your class was very difficult for me. Mm. Because there are times you move fast and I couldn't follow. And then, you know, I came for your class with my mom. Mm -hmm. and my mom said, I loved that class. I loved it. And then she said, oh, we should keep coming. So I come and come, come. And then, and then at, this, at some point I started crying. And then like, I feel every time I finish your class, I'm in your class, I start my life again. Mm. It's that reborn. Mm. And also you work with kids, which makes sense to me because you have that reborn energy, that kids energy, that freshness mm. in your practice. Whether you call it holding the space or sharing your experience. How did you come to that? How did you work through the sadness that you felt? And also I wanted to say when you say you felt anger, actually I think anger is similar, is very similar to sadness. Yes. Right? Oh, totally. Yes. Oh, totally. Yes. I, I actually call anger an umbrella mo emotion. I, umbrella I, emotion. Yeah, I do huh. a lot of work with empathy. And when I teach empaths, I'm like, we use umbrella terms. And, and I would say, because being a person who didn't identify as trans and identified as trans, I, I see it clearly the words that I would use before a transition, that really meant, I'm a trans person, I just, it was just an umbrella term. This term that had a whole bunch of feelings in, and so anger is one of those terms. Um, how did I move through the sadness was that. At first, I called it sadness, and then I had to break it up. Mm. Mm. Like for example, I was in class one day, I, and I was taking class, and this is before I transitioned. And so we were doing yoga, you know, we were going through the motions. And my body got extremely hot. And then I noticed all the men in started taking off their, their shirts. And I was like, as I'm doing class, I'm like, this is interesting. Why are they taking off their shirts? Like, I don't understand this thing. And I'm like, hmm, let me just take off my shirt. <laughs> so I took off my shirt. and. The class became the most difficult class for me because taking off my shirt for me felt naked. And I was confused. I'm like, I'm supposed to be a boy. Boys clearly don't care about these things. Like, why do, why do I care? And one of the things that came up was because you see your body as female and bearing your breasts makes you feel naked. Look at that feeling. And then I started taking care of that feeling. I started to nurture, whenever that sensation came up, I started to nurture it, talk about it, um, try to understand it. I had to read a lot of books. I had to find a whole new vocabulary for what sadness meant. Because sadness meant being misgendered. Sadness meant me misgendering myself. Sadness meant feeling exposed. Sadness meant being put in places that I felt like I shouldn't be. It meant a whole bunch of things that I had to now find words for so that I can take care of myself. So that I can stop subjugating mm. who I really am. Just to fit in. And that, but that required, so when I went to class, if I go and we do a pose and my body says do something, like my body says do the next stage of the pose, I'm going to do that. So if we go to class and the person is, the teacher says that we're going to do 
I don't know, side, um, we'll come back to our half moon pose. Not that everybody out there will know what that means, but whatever. I go to my half moon pose and my body says, I need you to grab that back leg. Then I'm going to do that, even though the teacher's not teaching them. Because my body is saying, you need to take care of me. You have spent all this time focusing on other people and letting other people tell you what's going on with you. You need to take care of me. And started taking care of that action is what helped me to move not that I'm over my sadness because I still it's something that I still have to deal with but when it happens I I know what's going on with me I'm not walking around clueless so then when I at the end of class I have something real to share with the class it's like that a couple months ago when I said I've been discriminated against I've been been hurt I said that not because the response that I got back from the students that I appreciate, it wasn't for them to feel bad. Mm -hmm. I said that because I was talking to students and students were acting like I don't have these problems. Because I get it. My practice says come in the space. You know, and so that's all they're seeing. They're not seeing the things that I had to do to do that. And so when I said I was disc discriminated, Meaning, on my way to work, someone acted like I was going to hurt them because I'm a black person when I'm just going to work. I've gotten in the, that's the reason why I don't get in the elevator at Equinox is because I've had experiences where people are acting like I'm doing something when I'm just at work. And so I don't go in the elevator so I don't want to engage and feel like someone is feeling like they're in danger when I'm just at work. And so I wanted the class to recognize that I'm feeling this and I can still turn it around. I wanted them to, to, that we are on the same level because I think that people don't recognize that other people are going through it. When I started transition, I thought it was just me. And then what helped me so much is I'm listening to trans women post-op no changing their body, on hormones, and we're all saying the same thing, and that thing saved my life because I felt like I'm not alone. This thing is real. I can actually breathe, and I find that if we can, if, if we can all do that for ourselves as individuals, then we're not... Then when we start to communicate with each other, I can actually talk to you. And even though our views may be different, you, we can actually have a conversation and still have different views and not be against each other. You know, the, the, your pancreas and your lungs don't do the same thing. But they work together. <laughs> right. <laughs> they don't do the same thing, but they work together. And they don't complain about it. Right. Because they don't do, they're not supposed to be doing the same thing. And so then I'm like, why can't we do this as humans? You know, the, the hermetic principle, as above, so below. So if that's okay for, the, for that pancreas, it's okay for me to be an individual. To show up not as the same. Which, you know, based on my upbringing, that was a hard transition. To just show up as sage without feeling I have to change myself so that other people can see who Sage really is. You know the class when you shared about your story um, being discriminated? After that class, I wrote an article about my depression, all of that. And then that article got the most views. Mm. To me, the fact that that article got a lot of views is the result of me brave enough, empowered by you, to share my story. That was really the starting point of me transforming life, mm. my life, mm. is not only recognizing who I am, but actually living it. Yes. And that is the hard part. Yes. <laughs> because there are things that you just know subconsciously all your life but to sh even be able to 
put a word onto it, talk to someone about it, write about it, have so many people build it. Like that is takes a lot of courage. Because we are taught that. I I, I would disagree with that. I think that the way that we live our life requires us to have courage to do that. But I feel that if we nurture that from a from the seed, from the child, then when it comes time to do that, it's not courage that we're sh- that we're showing. It's more presence. Mm. We have to be courageous now because we all, I mean, at least people. My age and a little bit younger. I think my I have a younger sister. I have a younger brother and a younger sister. But my youngest sister is four years younger than me, so she, we grew up in the same time. Even though, when I talk to her, there's a difference from her generation and my generation.、Mm. But we all grew up under the opposite of that. And so to get to where we need to go, it requires courage. Does it make sense? So if we do it right, then the next, the younger generation, it will be second nature to them. They're just gonna be. They're just gonna be. Which is what we're trying to do. We're, what we're saying is, one of the one of the analogies that I love using in class is like when you go and learn a new language, the first thing you learn is to conjugate the word to be, because that is the root of the language. You learn I am, you are. He, she, it is. That's the first concept that you have to break down, because from then you build from that. And so, I am is the first concept that we have to break down. And so, that's the thing that we should be being. I am is a presence. It's a thing. It's a. It's an. This rock does not take courage for this rock to be. <laughs> right. When a squirrel is running around being a squirrel, it's just being a squirrel. You know, my friend has a dog. And her dog was barking at something, and she was like,、oh, "Why is my dog doing that?" I'm like, "Because your dog's a dog. The dog is in the act of being. It's us. We're changing that because we don't know how to be. We struggle with being, and because that, it takes courage. When in reality, it's just a state of being. It's just a state of. It's just being. a state of being." Which is hard. I mean, hard because of the way that we live our world.、I、feel like if we grew up in a, if we were being born now, and to be growing up twenty years from this point, we would be saying a different thing. We wouldn't use courage, because people tell me all the time as a trans woman, "Oh, you're so brave," and I'm always confused. You're telling me I'm brave for being myself. That that sounds very strange. I'm brave. But what they're really saying is, you're brave for doing something that I'm not able to do, and I'm not going to accept that. I'm not going to let you demean yourself so that you can put me on a pedestal. No, it does not take bravery to be ourselves. We have to use that that tool now, but it doesn't take bravery. We are a part of nature. Nature does not have to do anything. It just is in a state of being, which is why we appreciate its beauty because it's in a state of being. In the state of being, it's presence. The infinite now.、And、the you, infinite now. Yes. And you can't get there without. I am. I have a question, which is, when I'm talking with you now, the infinite now and the being is super powerful because I feel it because you're sitting right next to me. Right. And, and I have it. Yeah. And when we go out to live our lives. There are so many forces. I want this. I want that. And then people discriminate. People try to put you down. And is there are a lot of attacks. Yes. How do you stay focused? And as if all of those attacks don't even exist. We were in front of the New York Public Library、uh, near Bryant Park、mm-hmm. the other day, and my husband was saying, "Look at these people." Everyone is in their own world. Yes. Look at them. Yes. And he said to me, "If you train yourself to be focused without being impacted,、mm. whereas you, I'm very sensitive person.、Mm-hmm. You know that it's、I、very、am. easy to be <laughs> impacted. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How do you stay centered? 
these questions. Um, <laughs> um, I will reflect a yoga practice. You go into your pose, your thighs start burning, your foot starts itching, your head starts doing this, you can't breathe, the music gets too loud, the light is in your eye, the teacher was mumbling, this person next to you fell, this person opened up their water, it's the same thing. <laughs> Does that make sense? And so when I started taking yoga, it was very hard for me to just do my practice because, you know, like for me, if I'm turning my back, I can tell the person behind me is not doing the pose. Like I can feel it. And it's like, it's bothering me. <laughs> you know, this person over here in the left side, why are you on your left leg? Why? The teacher said, right, why are you on your left? <laughs> and I, when I did my second teacher training, um, my teacher April Martucci, what she tried to teach us was to bring your focus on your mat. She said it for like three weeks. You know, the training was a, maybe nine months, eight months. So for three weeks, she's saying, put your focus on your mat. And I'm like, okay, yeah, lady, I'll do that. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm like, mm. <laughs> and then the third week when she said, put your focus on the mat, it was like, oh. I get it now. I'm too busy worrying about everybody else. What is my job in this class right now? And my job in the class at the time was like, you're just taking class. So now, why are you acting like a teacher? Why are you trying to police all these other people? Just focus on yourself. And it took some time. It wasn't like that moment and then I was like, oh, perfect. No. Even still today, I have to bring my focus back. Um... The second thing I'm going to reflect is that I work, a lot of the community that I teach in karate has special needs. And that was my biggest teacher. Because teaching someone with special needs, I had to have a focus that was unbreakable. Because the moment that I faltered, because this, you know, they're hypersensitive, they're even... I'm not going to say more sensitive. I think when I say special needs, that that's very much me. It's just, for me, it's not external. I internalize, so no one would notice that that's happening. So we haven't, we're having the same experience. The same stimuli is pulling my attention. But I noticed that when I let it do that, I lost the student. I spent the rest of the class trying to get them to come back. And so I had to f f work on a focus that was unbreakable. And, you know, working with kids, that's hard. You know, this child's doing this. But once I did that, and it wasn't like what I, what I try to tell the kids that I'm teaching. It's like, it's not that I don't notice it. I notice it. I just have to make a choice to focus on what I'm focusing on. It's a decision that I have to make. That's not easy. But we're going, I'm going to have to do that. And I'm doing that for you. And so when I walk out in the streets... And I notice that people are really disconnected. I say to myself, that's what the present moment is. The present moment is I'm noticing that people are disconnected. I don't have to become that. I'm noticing that people are disconnected. And that's all it is. It doesn't have to be anything more than that. People are in their own world. I come back to the present moment. People are in their own world, and I just have to make sure that I stay focused on what's happening right now. Because for me as a trans person, when I'm not in the moment, I'm experiencing discomfort. Because my, I spent 37 years suppressing myself. And so those are the, those are the skills that I know the most, is self-suppression. And so for me to overcome that, to rewrite that programming, I have to be present. So that when something comes up for me, I can say, yes, that, I saw that. I saw that. Otherwise, I find that if I don't stay present by the time I get home, I'm, I'm having the same situation where I'm like, I'm not going to wake up tomorrow. Because I've stopped focusing on, I stopped being in the present. And that's really what yoga is all about. That's really what karate is about. It's like... People say karate is about fighting and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, you're learning how to fight. Yes, you do. I'm not going to take away that. 
But what I've learned most about karate is presence. I've learned to be where I am right then. And then when the student shows up, that's what's showing up. And whatever happens, happens. So, if, you know, I work with kids who are two, and crying is a lot. You know, crying happens with a two-year-old. And how I used to handle it is, you know, don't cry. Don't cry. And this is pre-transition. And in post-transition, I'm like, you can cry if you want. Like, it's fine. I'm just going to be here. I'm not going to change because you're crying. We're here to do a job, and we're going to do this job. But I'm here with you. We're, I'm in it. And at first, it was really hard because I felt a lot. But now, when a child comes in cry, they if a child comes in cries, and I go and take them, they're gonna, they stop crying immediately. Not because I'm special, but because before I walk up to that child, I'm telling myself, this child is a representation of your own upsetness. What would you do yourself as I'm walking over? That's, like, that's why I said what I said in that class, because people don't see that that's what's going on in my internal. Someone shows up late, and I feel their anxiety, I'm saying to myself, like, that person's anxious. Wouldn't you be anxious if you came to class late? <laughs> okay, leg up into the sky, and then I'll say something like, it's okay. Take your time. I'm, yes, I'm saying it for the class, but I'm really, because if, if people were looking at me, they would see me looking at them through the mirror. I'm really talking to that person. And generally, when that happens, that person comes up to me at the end of the class and says, you know, well, you said everything I needed to hear today. And that just tells me, okay, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Because you are doing that. Yes. Because it actually, it actually happened. Yeah. And the proof was there. Does it make sense? And, and it, it sometimes it's hard. It's not until the person reflects it back. You know, because I'm in the moment. We're all human. I'm in the moment. The present is the only thing that exists. The past is gone. <laughs> the future does not exist. And so until that person comes back to reflect the past, it's not happening for me. And then when I see that, it gives me something. I'm like, okay. And so everything that I did that day, I'm going to repeat. Because I want to come back at least from this place. And then what I'm finding is that I have greater and greater grace. I don't have to work as hard to come in. It's not as difficult. I can be more present. The I am, it's like, I'm not Christian, but I do, we all know Christian, Christianness, and the burning bush, the thing that God said through the burning bush was, I am that I am. And when I, I was studying that for a, con, a whole year, because I thought that was so... I am that, that I, I am. am. I am that I am. And it, what it woke up in me is the I am presence. And that, not to change anyone's religious belief systems, but to highlight the teaching. That that burning bush was trying to show that the I am is where we're supposed to be. I am that. I am. And so I work on, because that the question what came, that came up to me was like, well, who is the I? Mm. Who is the I that I'm talking about? When someone says, are you hungry? And I say, I'm hungry. Who am I referring to? And if I don't, if I'm not aware or if I'm confused on that, then my work is to figure out who that I is. Who that I is? Mm -hmm. And so when I work with kids, my work is, like, who is the I? When they say I, who are they? What, what is that? And I try as much as I can. It's hard. But I try as much as I can to let that, that come forward. You mean the I? The big I? The who, whoever that is. The I. Because people will say, you know, oh, I can't do that. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? You just did it. What, who is that that can't? Your body has an, a problem with doing that, but you can do it. You just gotta get your body to figure out how to do that. So who is that I? That, that's the thing that I'm trying to encourage in others.
because once I found my eye, the journey has been amazing. It's been, I mean, it's tough, but myself, it's been amazing because I can breathe, I can, I smell the trees, uh, I know where I am in space, you know, things come up and I know how I feel about that and I'm not saying, oh, I don't know. I, what is that? I, I don't, there's no question I can clear it up for myself.